Hey everyone, Walter Crosby, uh, Helix Sales Development, your host of Sales and Cigars. So today we got an episode of a guy who was referred to me from Mike Capuzzi, who helped me write my book. Mike's helped Jeff, our guest, write a couple of books. Jeff's an interesting character. He's out in Pennsylvania, loves cigars, has a mattress store, has a consulting business. He's got his hands in a lot of things. He's a true entrepreneur. And we talk about customer experience. We talk about rooting out mediocrity. So go grab a cigar, grab a cocktail, strap in for another fun episode of Sales and Cigar. So Jeff, welcome to the program. I appreciate you taking some time. Yeah, hey, happy to be here with you and uh, excited to get into our time together. Now, we've got a lot to cover. You've got to lead an interesting life, retail business, uh, consulting business. So let's talk a little bit about your journey. I've always find that when I talk to entrepreneurs, they have an interesting story. When they were 10 years old, they didn't think that they were going to be doing what they do right now. What was the magical moment or kind of share yeah, that I with mean, you? I was exposed to entrepreneurship as a kid. My grandfather had bookstores and book publishing businesses. I saw my uncles on my father's side doing their thing. My grandfather on the other side of the family was didn't own the business, but he worked as a master cabinet maker for a lumber yard back when that was how cabinets were made as opposed to brought in from overseas sitting on shelves now. But uh, well, I'm, he took I'm buying cabinets now that are still made by some craftsmen that yeah. better be based on the price that we're paying for. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure you're going to love what you get. But yeah, he took care of that business like it was his own. He always had that kind of integral aspect to it and uh, the way he ran his day. So, you know, for me, entrepreneurship began when I had to go on a church youth group trip to Colorado and my parents couldn't afford to pay for it. So I started mm -hmm. cutting grass and doing washing cars, detailing cars, cleaning them up around the neighborhood. Built that up. It was three phases, sold off each phase to friends at 16 to buy a car and uh, had them pay me a little bit of their, there was a fee and then there was the fee on top of the cuttings for a while. Who helped you with that idea? Who helped you figure out the structure of that deal? I can't say right now that anybody helped me. It just kind of made sense because there was like, literally it was like East Cocalico Heights phase one, two, and three. And I'm like, you know, there's enough work to do in all these phases. And I got friends that live in all three. So I'm going to give this chunk to this guy, this chunk to this guy, this chunk to this guy. And that's what I did. It just logically made sense to me. And my first car was an 81 Camaro and I needed 1500 bucks. So I sold each chunk for $500 and, and got it done. <laughs> and then the kid's parents stepped in uh, the next summer. I'm like, why are we still paying you an override to cut grass when you're not doing anything? I'm like, because I sold it to you for 500 bucks. Could have sold it to you for more. So, you know, that was that, where... That's your first big objection, but it's not the kid. It, it's mom and dad and your 16, 17 year old kid having to argue with mom and dad that's interesting yeah maybe it was the fact that i was driving around once a week in my camaro to collect envelopes <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe that was the problem. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. it was the presentation of things that didn't make anybody, anybody feel warm and fuzzy. That's probably what it was. You know, for me at the time, it wasn't a big deal. I, you know, look, when you're 16 and you're on your own for the first time and you get the windows down, listen to music, like you've got life. Yeah, like you've just got life in your hands. You're controlling it. Life is good. Absolutely. And so, and so that was that time. Worked in restaurants thereafter. Hung around with a lot of adults at the time. Good people, but maybe we had a little too much fun too early. Spent a couple years in the corporate world in actually building products, windows and doors, and had a good career there and got chewed up quick. And I decided then I don't want to do this. I really spent two years of my life on a W-2, adult life on a W-2 that is. And then I, upon that corporate career ending, I'm like, you know what? I can go out on my own in some capacity. And I got into the furniture and mattress industry at that point on a national team calling on national accounts and uh, bought that business and then just grew it and sold it, got into retail and consulting over the way. And now here I am. So you've got the bug as a teenager observing how family members and people you respected lived their life, had values, and then you went out and I can do this, I can borrow this lawnmower, I can go do that. And you did the things that entrepreneurial minds do. I'm curious your take on, like, I don't see a lot of, like when we had snow and we had a snow day, like my brother and I grabbed a shovel, not a snowblower, hey, hey. shovel, and we went out and made some money. It was fun. 
it was hard work, but I don't see that anymore, right, is my point. I'm kind of like interested in your take because you did it, you lived it, you're living it now. How do we pass that on to the next generation and why do you think we don't see as much of that as we, as we used to? I think because a lot of parents are giving. It's an innate and good belief and desire to want better for your kids than you had, right? My kids have never had to go cut grass to participate in an extracurricular activity because we provide for that. We believe, we believe that having that as part of their growing up is a positive thing. However, we do believe that work is good, so they do both work. My, well, my oldest son, he's an adult now. My youngest still works. He works at Chick-fil-A. They've done a little bit of the snow shoveling over the years. Here in Pennsylvania, the problem is, like this past winter, we had nothing nothing else. yeah and then other winters we do get some and, and you know i'll have to kind of push them to go out they think that's kind of odd i think societally you don't know your neighbors anymore. that's you a good know, point you don't know kids on the block anymore and so and kids are you know they got their phone in front of their face 24 7 you see them at a, at a restaurant they're all on their phones talking to each other there's no person to person connection so it's odd you, mom dad you want me to do what drag a <laughs> shovel down the block to that house that i've never hey. even Talk to that person and you want me to and go knock on a mind? door and talk to somebody that I've never spoken to before. Yeah. So it's real. I don't know that it's really about work because like my youngest son taught himself how to do video editing. So he's got the d desire and drive. And I don't think it's about work per se. I think it's about the skills of being able to speak to somebody, being able to go up to a stranger and ask them a question and having the confidence to do so. And when you hear no, it's not the end of the world. You just go to the next driver. And I think that's where we're missing out. You know, so I know I push my kids to uh, to do some work in that regard, up those skills. I think there's a balance there, right? Where we're, we want more for our kids. We want to give them more than we had. And that's admirable and, and I think really, really appropriate. But we did the same thing. My daughter, school was most important. Getting grades was important. But she always had a job in some capacity. And she's in school. She's going to leave school without college, without debt. But she still worked doing various things. She's got internships. She's, she works for me me to a certain extent and then she's got retail jobs down in school she doesn't have to but she wants certain things and she doesn't want to feel obligated to ask questions or ask us for the money so yeah it's a good it's but it's a challenge as a parent to, to transfer those values and those beliefs to and I think you're really right because we see it a lot in salespeople where they don't have that confidence and it, it shows up with them needing to be liked by everybody and that gets in the way of them being effective at having those uncomfortable conversations with prospects and customers sometimes that's a great observation. So you had this entrepreneurial journey. It really kind of explains what you're doing. So let's start with, uh, I mean, you run, you run a mattress store and you do it in a way that's different than other guys do it. So can you kind of talk about your philosophy there and, and what that's about? There's some great stuff on your websites about that. Yeah. So, you know, that's a business I co-own with my business partner, Ben. You know, the reason we're successful there is because our skill sets perfectly match each other. He's that operator integrator. I'm that visionary, that marketer, that drive forward, bringing all the ideas. And together we sift and sort through what each of us thinks is success and then we put it into action and then quickly it moves from his desk to our team. A lot of folks think that I push a, a ton of stuff onto Ben and well, yeah, he does operations and payables and, and handles a little more of the paperwork that way because I don't think in business he ever turned the checkbook over to somebody else. Anyway. Like partner right yeah, right yeah like you always have watch on it right absolutely uh, but uh beyond that stuff like you know you mentioned our pre-show how's the knee doing i had my knee replaced nine weeks ago while i was away i was at the store i've maybe been at the store now seven or eight times since that happened since i had the knee replaced back in mid-february nothing fell apart ben actually took his own vacation in the bahamas really great vacation in the bahamas with his family he had a couple other moments where he was off he's a sixers fan so it's playoff the season was running out and so he caught a lot of those games and you know we've built a business that's got systems and value to it and the value for our customers is we're going to help them find the right fit so they wake up happy we're not selling you a white rectangle at a discount we believe that that's our purpose help you wake up happy so you're more productive because when you're more productive in our community our community is better and our business is better and we're really committed to that. And it sounds like sounds like empty, cliched words that you put on a poster over my shoulder with a little mountaintop and a sunrise. But when you really boil it down, that's what we're doing. We are helping people wake up happy because I know what it's like to wake up in pain 
been doing it for 27 years with this knee of mine, or 25 <laughs> years, I'm sorry. It really sucks. And so when you can start the day better, you finish better. And that's that's how we help our customers. But that becomes your driver too. That becomes the value you can carry, the thread that goes through your whole team, the people on the floor talking, interacting with your customers. It's not just, yeah, it's a mattress, but you're really selling, waking up, you know, happier and feeling better in the morning, right? And community aspect. That whole piece is what you sell. If you want to go to buy a mattress, you can do that anywhere. This is, you know, it's a different approach. And to me, it speaks to what we're supposed to do in sales. And that's, it's help somebody with a problem. They may not know they have the problem. They may not recognize what it is, but it's our job to be able to shine that light on it and help them see it and help them solve it. That's really the driver. It's not money. The money will take care of itself if we're doing the right thing. Yeah. I mean, very rarely is it money that's the issue. And I say that fully respecting our customers' money. You know, there's a couple statements that we use. Our mission, you know, so our purpose about helping you wake up happy, more productive, our communities better. Our mission is to change the way you feel about mattress stores because our industry, by and large, has a terrible reputation. You know, pump and dump, get it in the hall. Like, we actually just hired someone away from a, a chain store who was a unicorn in their ecosystem and a great fit for us. You know, he's like, I can't get over that we're telling people three to four weeks to get their product at home. You know, the whole thing at that other store was get it the next day so they couldn't cancel and have buyer's remorse. And I said, well, I want you to think about what that means for the customer and what that meant for you to sell it that. If you're on an immediate countdown clock, the second the credit card's been swiped, fearing a cancellation, I don't think that was ever really a sale at all. It's not a transaction. I don't even think it counts. Right. It doesn't. I don't even think it counts as a transaction. I think it counts as borrowing money for an undisclosed amount of time until the customer ultimately decides to let the delivery person in their house. Right. Because not every day was next day. Not every delivery was next day. It might have been a week. It might have been three days. To me, that's just such a terrible way to do business. So for us, it's, it's and, and think about it. You have your Mac. You know, people will buy, statistically, they're going to buy four new iPhones in the time they buy one new mattress. Interesting. They're going to buy two, maybe three cars in the time they buy a new mattress, especially if they're leasing. Statistically, you'll be in two houses before you buy a new mattress. Wow. In other words, people keep these things for a long time, 10 to 12 years on average. People move every seven years statistically, you know, three-year car leases, new iPhone. If you get it on the free plan, you're paying it off over two years. You see where the numbers break down. I say to people and my peers, I'm like, why are you creating this pressure cooker of getting it in the home and same day? next day or three days when they have it for a decade what's another week or two at this point yeah their back hurts but their back's been hurting for two years and they tell us that all the time yeah you go to a doctor and you got a back problem and they're going to help you fix it or you have a knee problem they didn't say okay yeah jump up we'll do it this afternoon or tomorrow that would have freaked you out right yeah go to the heart surgeon that does next day <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, what are those balloon catheter insert things yeah that's right. the guy you want. So, you know, for me, it, it's always been about experience. You touched on, you know, the value equation of helping somebody understand the purchase. You know, it's it's so interesting to me to overhear these conversations and the people who don't understand what a bed frame does and what a box spring foundation does. And I'm thinking like, okay, you have four bedrooms in your house. You got four of these things. You sleep on one of them. But then we have to remember, we're not our customers. They don't do what we do each and every day. And we're a busy society. We got a lot of things going on as people. Why would anybody think about a bed frame or a box spring in, their, in the course of their day? Of course they wouldn't. So it's our job to walk them through and explain how a proper system can work for them and benefit them. There's a level of, it's not product education as much as it's sort of market education about what this is supposed to do, how it's supposed to work, what that really, that benefit, how that ties back to what solving problems. And I think when you start at that level, right, you as a salesperson, you're creating credibility because you're trying to help somebody understand what they have currently. Because you're right, I haven't thought about a bed frame. I know the one up in the guest room is uncomfortable on purpose because I don't want guests to stay much longer than two or three days. One of our qualifying questions when somebody says I need something for a guest room, do you love them or not? <laughs> You know, but my kid had a, a mattress in her room that was spectacular. Like it was, a, like if we got up, my wife have an, I have a tendency at different times to get up in the middle of the night because we can't sleep. If you go up there, since she's away in school, and you just go up there and lay down, you can fall asleep pretty quickly because of the comfort of that that whole system. And that's what they did. They sold they sold a system. It is helping them and educating them to get to that point. It's not pushing the transaction, and that's how you differentiate yourself. And all those customers aren't necessarily for you. Right. I mean, part of our sales languaging as 
we're going through our greeting process is pretty early. Hey, look, we're going to have a conversation. We're actually going to invite you to sit down over here and see how our solutions fit your needs. And sometimes we don't have, sometimes we're just not a fit for everybody that comes in our store. But we're gonna understand that. So if you're open to it, you wanna have a conversation, sit down. And what's most interesting about that is some of our best customers are like, yes, absolutely. Because everywhere else they've gone, it's like, oh, you're here for the big sale. They whip the flyer out of their back pocket. They put the discount, the extra postcard mailers that went out this week in their hand. So it's immediately about price. It's immediately about a deadline. It's immediately about, can I sell you something? Not how does what I have fit? Instead, we're talking about, let's just have a conversation. Let's get to the bottom of why you're here tell me why that's a big it's always a good place to start doesn't matter if you're selling mattresses or sales training you why yep and then you get to listen and we do that in an environment that's unlike i mean we're in our store but it's in an environment away from a little lounge area and we actually have a little tv and on that tv is all of our different reviews and different formats scrolling through over our shoulder a whole bunch of happy customers endorsing us as we're having a conversation right environment selling environment matters and that can be done in any business. And so we, those are the kinds of things that we do. I'm actually really energized about that business now because we're, we've been making some new moves as far as like upping our game and far presentation goes. We've got some remodeling going on. We added these little private, basically it's like, think of it like a cubicle paneling that comes up about maybe 35, 40 inches high. But then offshooting that is a little wall that sticks out that's not quite as high. Creates a little private testing area in each spot. Because that's just weird. You look, like people feel uncomfortable. So what can you do in your business to remove that uncomfortableness a little bit? If you're a financial person, most people coming to financial people, financial advisors aren't in fantastic position. There's embarrassment, there might be shame maybe they got bad credit you know so what can you do to lower that barrier of uncomfortableness so for us it's a physical thing we just kind of created these little pods that don't cocoon you in but also it doesn't make you feel as a customer laying down on a mattress in your clothes with your shoes pointed up and your eyes looking up at the ceiling <laughs> And I'm staring at you like, ready to buy yet? Are you ready to buy yet? Right. Just like at home, there's always somebody staring at you when you're, when you're laying in bed. So and you have a couple other ventures, but and I think you take the ideas that you have in that store, the value, the sales environment, the language that you use, the design of the space, and you can help other business owners apply that. And they don't have to be selling mattresses. They could be selling a service or a product. But can we talk a little bit about how you take those principles and apply them and help other Main Street businesses? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll do two examples. One is in the furniture business and the one is in deck building. So that whole change the environment idea. So in our retail store, we have a dream room where if we get down the process long enough and you're like, you know, I think this is the one, but I'm just not sure. We'll move that demo model into a dream room. Looks like a hotel room. Try it out, test it out, take a nap, read a book. Don't do anything you don't want mom to see because you can close the door and lock it, <laughs> but you relax, right? Away from all the noise of a store and salespeople, whatever. And so we took that concept out to uh, a Natuzzi franchise. If you're familiar with Natuzzi fine leather sofas, you know, they're top of the mark in the industry. Like Natuzzi is top of the mark for most any higher HOA gated community in your neighborhood. And then there's another echelon for like athletes and superstars and celebrities. But Natuzzi is, is a luxury item. So this franchise, the problem is they had a big chain retailer coming in that basically could sell a whole house of furniture for the price of one sofa, right? So the value equation, they were they were in fear. Of. You know, I said, well, I think the way we can shift this, and you know, we were working with them at the time on some CRM solutions that we offered. But I said, I think you need to apply a dream room strategy. You've got to develop these different dream rooms around your furniture about how people use it. Because it's not about blue, brown, and black sofas. It's about, is this sofa going in a room like my grandmother's living room that I call the sacred room? You know, no food no drink, no shoes. You're sitting there to reflect your quiet, quiet conversation, visiting with friends, but not too rowdy, you know, the sacred room. Then there's Grand Central Station, right? That's where you got your family. You're eating in there. You're doing some work in there. You need chaos. all the ports. Yeah, it's chaos, right? You got pets, so you got to worry about claws and about stain. Grand Central Station room. Then there's the power couple room where they don't have kids at home anymore, but they're busy and they got to get up. So the speed of how power recliner comes back up is important. So we developed these different vignettes and named them as such. This way, the question was, well, tell me how you use your living room. Is it more like Grand Central Station or is it more like church? Where do we fall in between? And then we were able to direct. And that now framed the conversation to, here's how you're gonna use this. Here's the features that are gonna apply to your life. We'll figure out the color. It's all custom order anyway, but we're it's gonna find the right fit. That's really taking that 
I'm just relating that concept to what, what other people do, whether they're selling a high-end product or a, a service. You still, as a salesperson, we need to be able to drill into, get that person to think about what it is that their issue is or how they perceive that challenge. You know, when you have that furniture store or other product that you can, you're making that visual come to life in 3D. So that person is experiencing the product and connecting it to their life. They've literally made that connection once once you go into that room. And you have variables within those vignettes, I would imagine, with lighting and things that you can kind of oh, yeah. amp it yeah, up and turn it down, right. music and TVs and such. Yeah, I mean, you know, you had, then you would complement different rooms, got different kinds of coffee tables, some with the lip tops, some with storage, you know, touch lamps versus fumbling to find a switch. The options there were really limitless. You know, you had a building block of, is it that power couple room, that grand central room, that sacred room? I always forget the fourth room, but we built off of that. And you shifted the conversation from price. You shifted the conversation from how fast can I get it to this is made for me. Yeah, it's personalized that experience and customer experience starts before they walk into your showroom, before they engage with your business, right? It could be a website, it could be something that they've seen, right? But it's creating that consistency of your brand. And then when they walk in, you know, you're just amplify it. That's a really powerful connection because that person is no longer thinking about a product. They're thinking about the experience they're gonna have when they're at home in their space, in their room. And they've connected the dots. So yeah, I love yeah. that. I thought of another thing that I've talked somebody through. We had a wealth advisory client at one point. This goes back a number of years. And I said, you know, the issue with for you, for those kinds of businesses, insurance, wealth advisory, you know, any kind of intangible product that involves the person's money and you're the agent, you know, there's a lot of experience happening where you're not present, namely the envelope that shows up in the mailbox after each quarter. So why don't you play that game with your customer. Here's what year one's gonna look like, here's what year five is gonna look like, and here's what year 10 is gonna look like. You know, and if you're doing this game right now, those year one envelopes, especially last year, there were some pretty scary envelopes, right? But you need to paint a picture of what working together is gonna look like. And every other advisor is gonna say, you know, it's the long game, it's the long game. You're gonna have some down months, down quarters, down years, you're gonna have some up years. But yada, yada, it's gonna be seven to eight percent, blah, 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 right? I'm already bored. What if you laid out those envelopes for that person? What if you'd actually did a little work before that meeting where your intake form, you kind of understood where their wealth position is or isn't, where their credit situation is or isn't, where their equity in their home situation is or isn't. You could play that game and lay out that picture right in front of them and say, now, do you find this 10 year or retirement goal? What was the sweat factor in between as we like do, going through that exercise is going to tell you with that client, going to tell you if you're going to get that deal or not. How uncomfortable they are. Their risk yeah, tolerance. Yeah. A lot of people say they're committed to seeing some envelopes come with no money, but that first one that shows up with a 12% decline or an 18% decline on the year of yep. last year. What do you think your life's like come January 10th as an advisor? Awful. Phone doesn't stop ringing with negativity. Shift the environment, shift the ins the experience. I think those things, so you can take, it doesn't matter the product or service. It's about thinking about a strategy and aligning it with who you want your ideal customer to be. And then making those people feel so comfortable that they make a decision that is that they're comfortable with. And whether it's a mattress, financial advisor, insurance, doesn't matter, right? We're helping that buyer make a solid decision that they're gonna be comfortable with for a long time. I think that's part of what salespeople struggle with is they think of the short-term transaction rather than the long game and it's a huge problem and I think another I'd like to pivot a little bit I mean you've got businesses you've got retail businesses which are hard I like to talk a little bit about mediocrity and making sure that doesn't become part of our culture in a company and how do we root that out before it has a chance to take hold any thoughts on that yeah I'll give you an example right from the store that just happened with this new this new guy that we brought on board so we're you know we bet on the jockey right not the horse with him we knew the person was really great we knew we'd have to kind of break some bad habits so i overheard i guess it was monday of this week when we recorded kind of overheard the typical hardcore salesy stuff that doesn't match up with our language the customer was looking to put a new mattress inside of an old waterbed frame which happens often because that furniture was of quality and it can last for a long time so people don't want to get rid of that if they appreciate the value of it and like it but they can put a new mattress inside the frame 
And so he kind of stumbled because it wasn't a question he'd gotten a lot over the years prior and then just went down, so what's your budget? And then and realized quickly he'd made a mistake. Like he realized. He phoned a friend, got our sales manager in to kind of... That's good. T.O., right? The next question that came up related to the furniture, he brought in the sales manager, which was very smart. Compare that to Wednesday night, 6.45, we close at 7, in comes a couple, he follows our process to a T and writes a $10,000, 500 sale. And so I said to him, I said, so the difference, you can do this. You can sell in our environment. You can sell using our, our language, our process, right? Where the customer feels appreciated, where we're answering the questions. The difference is a couple words. And you saw that Monday versus Wednesday night because it was really the same kind of product the customer was interested. And so those few words cost five figures. Maybe that person will come back because we did get a quote. We'll see. <laughs> But uh, we're usually pretty good at getting them back. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, that mediocrity of just defaulting to the lowest common denominator, which is price. I think, I think talking about price just is like a magnet to suck mediocrity in all around you. That's why I shared that story that way, because it's the lowest common de denominator. I mean, really, how do you compete on price in 2023? It's, it's why I use kind of Amazon as a verb, like helping Main Street retailers live in an Amazon world. Everything can be price shopped. Everything can be Amazon. I was at Costco yesterday, my Battlefield Alliance coaching group would do a give back day. So Saturday, we're going downtown and giving some snacks out to the homeless. So I stocked up on a bunch of stuff and I'm walking out to the, out the door. There's HVAC, there's roofing, there's medical insurance insurance there's eyeglasses like everything you, you would think is a professional service commoditized you can, get through, you can get through costco and everybody knows costco is a tremendous value because they run an 11 percent margin how do you mm -hmm. possibly compete with that well if you choose to compete their game on price you can't and that's mediocre you know but if you want to protect your most valuable asset with a roof Shouldn't you go with a professional that watches it from start to finish? You know, that I've has credibility. Roofing, yeah, I've got roofing friends of mine. I said, I don't know why you guys aren't flying drones above the roof throughout the whole project. Why make somebody like for me, I would have to have a window right outside my office here. For me to see the full view of my roof, I'd have to walk half a block across the, the baseball field across the street to see the progress of what's going on. Like a $500 drone that you get to use over and over and over again. That and you have fun you with. Could, you have fun with. You can write off and you can fly it up and you can say, okay, here's how the project looks. Here's the pictures we took. Here's the problems. And when we start, we're going to have it flown out the same day. So you're going to start each day with where we start. You're going to see a picture each day with where we end. And you get to see the progress. And we catalog all that. And you can take that before the sale, right? If somebody's, you know, you're in a consultation process where you're trying to figure out if you're going to do the work with them. If you go and run a drone over their house and show them that there's two spots or that here's why these this type of shingle is why it's failing, right? And you can educate them before you get into anything else how powerful would that be right it's yeah. it's equivalent to your dream rooms and you're in the showroom so rooting out mediocrity you know one of the trigger points is talking about price early on in a process with a customer and i'll share a story i, I used to be in the sign business and i'd always try to take it's not a sign it's a piece of advertising and marketing that's going to be in front of people we're going to look at it like eyeballs and think about it as a radio ad or television ad right and if we charged for the sign the way that you charge for a radio ad, you'd never be able to afford the sign, right? And what I would do is I would get phone calls because this goes back to like yellow page ads when they actually had papers, uh, big books. People would call me and say, hey, I need a sign for my business. How much? So, you know, that tells you the price is an important part of the decision. So I would look at it. I would just say, hey, what do you sell? And he's like, well, I sell tires. I'm like, all right, cool. I need tires for my car. How much? And he's like, well, come on, man. You got what kind of car, what kind of tires, right? And then he's like, oh, you probably need to come look at my building. I'm like, yeah, that'd be helpful. The place to start, what are we trying to accomplish? I had the sale right there. So they just switched his mindset. And we went out and I'm like, look, price is an important part of the decision. And he's like, yeah, of course. I'm like, I can tell you right now, I'm probably not going to be the cheapest guy in town. You know, should we keep talking? And he's like, well, why are you more expensive? Why do you think? And then, you know, he's like, well, you, you're making sure that you're doing the right thing. I said, that's it. And, yep. I, you know, I had a customer for life, but we dealt with the, the price objective. We dealt with the criteria that how he's going to make the decision. There was difference between me and the six other people that did that in town. I was always busy, but it wasn't about, it was never about price. And those yep. folks yep. could go down the street. Yeah, I have a really sore story about an exterior sign for 
the retail store. I think this, this dovetails into mediocrity. So a mediocre salesperson just takes, forgets that they aren't their customer and the customer's not them. They forget the customer doesn't have their experience and depth of knowledge. I mean, if you're a pro, you have depth of knowledge, right? You should be. Just as a little offshoot, and I'll get back to this design story and about understanding that you're not your customer. You know, today in a lot of retail stores, people come in with a phone, blog posts, consumer reports, all kinds of internet research, which really isn't research. What you're reading a lot of times in almost any vertical is you're reading paid advertising disguised mm -hmm. as unbiased. And it's actually illegal, okay? If you were to pull that garbage on an infomercial, the FTC would be so far up your rear end, it wouldn't even be funny. But yep. because it's the internet, I'm, I don't feel any certain way about this, Walter, do I? Right? <laughs> um, I digress. Uh, so I but say, you make but, a point. I, but I say at times, in, in our process at times, you know, hey, you know, it used to be if you were in a space where the team you're in front of had a combined, if Ben and I are in the building, you know, a combined 60 and 70 years depth of experience, the consumer was really excited about that. Now we get these articles and these phones waved in our face as though we're dumb. I think so shifting back to the sign story and about how we're not our customer and our customers don't understand. Our customers know they want their name on a building like I did. So we're like, well, we got this much square footage and we can go on this facade and on this facade and we can divide it up. So yeah, put it up. Well, the problem is all the schematics looked really great. And this was, I guess, in fairness in 2011. So maybe technology is you know, it's obviously 12 years back, but we were rookies. We didn't know any better. We didn't ask to see two scale drawings or two see actual drawings on the side of the building. So I got a channel letter signed with a letter for that facade way up on the roof that was no oh. that did the 16 ounce bottle of water. You know exactly where I'm going. You couldn't see the damn sign. And when you're starting out, and we, you know, we weren't undercapitalized. That's one of the biggest mistakes people made starting out is being undercapitalized, thinking, thinking they'll get in motion faster than they actually will. But it really, like, I don't like wasting money. It really sucked to have that 22 grand be so unusable for that facade. The other facade was good. Actually, as we record this, that's all down, and we, we're going with one of those painted signs with lighted, with mm -hmm. lights illuminating it, and it's large and in charge and looks really good. But um, we got to scale drawings and visualizations on the building this time around. But there, that sign maker, he just took, well, this this person knows what he wants. I'll just give it to him. And that was the exact when we started button heads. It's like I gave you exactly what you wanted. Shut up. Leave me alone. What do you want from me? It's like well, I didn't know what I wanted. I'm relying on your expertise to give me guidance and support. And sometimes it's there's no magic malice involved by the salesperson. It's just ignorance on their part and they didn't ask the right questions. The sign business is not unique in the retail business. It's usually run by a technician, somebody that understands how to make something or do something. And I didn't know how to put a sign together, right? But I had right. understanding where I would come to go see a guy and he'd be like, all right, I want to put this over here and I want it to be this big. And I'm like, wow, okay, we could do that. I'd have to charge you twice as much as I would normally. And he'd be like, why? And I'm because it's going to fail. It's not going to work. So I went from selling something. I could have sold them something that was like $20,000 to selling like a $7,000 sign that just worked, right? Because it was the right thing to do. It was He was putting it in the wrong spot. He was looking at it the wrong way. And it was my job to flip that. But that's how I viewed it. It was my job to help him get it right. And it wasn't just to go sell a sign. And that guy was like, you just talked yourself out of money. And I'm like, no, sir. I talked myself into a customer who's going to, a happy customer that's going to tell other people. He gave me probably six other customers in in the neighborhood of people that like you got to talk to him because he's going to take care of you so doing the right thing always the right thing to do honesty having the depth of knowledge as you said about how to do something raising your hand when you don't know something going and grab that sales manager on the floor like like your guy did admitting that he didn't know something that's huge and, and encouraging people to make mistakes and learn from them right that getting a bloody nose in sales like losing a sale like a ten thousand dollar sale yeah yeah, we don't typically want to do that a second time. So how do I avoid that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sales Manager? And that's the other problem is that sales managers have, have a tendency to be weak in that they try to be a hero rather than try to be a coach. So you've shared, you know, I think the point I want to make here is that you have a, a Main Street retail focus, um, and but all of the principles apply to any sales job, any business, yep. right? Yep. Making sure the customer experience is there deliver value, connect the dots for the customer. Don't assume that they buy a mattress, right? Because 
We bought a mattress, you know, it was probably five years ago, and the first question the guy asked was, well, it wasn't the first question, but one of his early discovery questions was, when was the last time you bought a mattress? But he couldn't remember. He's like, well, did you buy one for a guest room or for a kid's room, right? And he helped us to try to, you know, try to pull this together and helped us realize, like, we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> And he said, well, there's going to be some, you're going to have some sticker shock here. Some of these mattresses that, you know, are going to be more expensive than you might experience. So like, we're going to work through that. And he did a really good job of yeah. making us feel comfortable. It would have been cool if he had a little, little walls built that we could have sat there and felt more comfortable, like, you know, having a conversation with two people sitting on a bed, looking up at the ceiling. Yeah. That, that would have been a great idea. But all of your principles apply to just about any kind of business. And I think that's, uh, I think that's important. It's not just retail tell you gotta this this applies everywhere so if, if somebody wants to reach out to you what's the best way to get to reach jeff if they're not in pennsylvania so i make it pretty simple it's one website you don't even have to say janakovo or spell it you just go to the and because i've got my hands in a bunch of different things maybe you just want to connect on social media that's cool you could do that maybe you want to see what we're doing in the retail business. There's buttons there for that. You want to see what I'm doing consulting wise or group coaching wise, same thing. So however you connected to our conversation today, it's kind of choose your own adventure, pick your own journey. I'm happy to have that connection, whatever it might be. We'll have that in the show notes so people can go, you know, go down to the, to the notes and, and click on that. So last question I always ask Jeff is past or present, does Jeff have a uh, relationship with cigars? Yes, I do. I have a relationship with cigars. I enjoy them. I was going to, my plan was to set up, run an ethernet cord because my modem's right outside the patio door and I was going to set up my desktop outside, but they're tearing down the building down the street. So that would have been terrible for a podcast. So I've been <laughs> smoking one up with you this morning. What, uh, what would you have been smoking, Jeff? What's your go-to? My go-to is a uh, tobacco coffee is my go-to. Easy, <laughs> kind of easy smoking, easy listening, hanging out on my own cigar. I'm kind of all over the place. I had a number of years ago, I had to go on uh, related to my knee and le left leg. I had to go on a six month course of vancomycin via a pick line and that messed up my taste buds tremendously to the point where I couldn't smoke cigars for about a year. The, 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 it was like, uh, uh, it's like I was puffing battery acid. Really? Um, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Strangest thing. So I kind of held off for a while and got back to it smoking some, you know, real light Connecticut leaf type stuff. I'm back on the buffet and the smorgasbord of cigars now. But the tobacco coffee is, is probably my go-to uh, right now. But I pretty much will try just about any of them. Anything. Isn't that one of the joys of cigars is going into a humidor and a cigar shop? You know, like, hey, I normally smoke a Padron 4000 and you look at the tobacco in the sky and like, what do you got? Surprise yeah. me. And yeah. to me, that's part of the adventure. You don't necessarily buy a box of those, but buy a couple of them and try it out. To me, that's fun. I'm fortunate to live about 25 minutes from a Cigars International. And if I'm on a hunt for something, I'll usually get one of their Blend Lab ones from one of the one of the tobacconists. Tobacconists, is that right? Tobacconists, uh, yeah. Tobacconists, yeah. There we go. I'll usually just say, hey, what, what one are you excited about in here? Never forget a guy, Jason. Uh, he still works there. He's like, well, this one's mine. I really like it. And here's why. I'm like, cool, give me one of those. And so that, that one they still run, I'm pretty sure. It's a good smoke. It's always like a little adventure. I was in Florida and I had kind of run out of cigars. So we were at dinner and I knew there was a cigar store walking distance. So my wife and I walked over and it's was Corona cigar. So everything, it's just like a warehouse of cigars inside. Grabbed a couple of sticks and went up to the counter and he's like, yeah, have you tried our cigar? I'm like, what do you mean your cigar? And he's like, we grow our own tobacco up in Claremont and we take it from field to the, what you have on the shelf. And I'm like, I had no idea. So we went and grabbed a couple of those, matched me up with what I wanted. And now I got something else that I enjoy that's a little different. And I can order those by, you know, and hand them out to people. And like, this was made in Florida, the whole process, right? Aged everything in Florida. We talked a little bit about that in the green room that, you know, if you understand what goes into a cigar from the field to the blending, to the aging, to the rolling part of it, to get it distributed to the store, um, and all the freaking taxes that are involved in, in that, depending upon what state you are. That's like a three to five year activity. We get to enjoy it for eight to 20 bucks a stick, right? Or you can go higher, but. Yeah, it's pretty wild to think about it that way. Eight to 20 bucks and. Uh, it's history. You, I mean, you, all the things that go into it awesome all right jeff uh let's leave it there i really appreciate you jumping on i'm glad to see you're not hobbling around anymore you're gonna be able to get back on a football field or run around i'm gonna get back on the jujitsu mat and get that black belt i left off there you the go purple. i'm gonna get back and get that so yes that's a serious sport jujitsu wrestling around tumbling people that's uh we're not want to do that with somebody it's, your size uh, 
It's fun. Yeah, the super heavies, we have some fun. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. 